Paul writes to the saints, the family of God at Philippi. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. Be of like mind. Have the same love. Be one in the Spirit and the purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're going to turn to 1 Peter 4 and begin there at verse 7. This is the chapter that's called Living for God. The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and be self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift they have received to serve others. Faithfully, administering God's grace in all its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, and to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Lord, I pray that you work within us to concentrate our minds so that we learn more about you. I pray that you will give me the strength and wisdom to preach your words, Lord, not my own. I thank you that we are here to listen to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as Christine said, this is the last of the one anothering talks. So today we're looking at serving one another, which really includes all of the last few weeks. So the first week was loving one another, then we were praying for one another, then encouraging one another, and last week was forgiving one another. So the service industry in Great Britain today accounts for about 80% of employment. This includes finance, public se sector, leisure, culture, etc. But in Christians, it should be 100% service, service of God. We're called to serve one another. And I bet we can all think of examples of bad service we've had, and I hope we can think of some good examples. Last week, Rob and I went out for a meal for our anniversary to a restaurant, and we experienced very good service, and it made us want to go back. So if we get good service in church, if we serve one another, it makes us want to come back, and we're united as a family. 
There are lots of examples in the Bible of serving. You can go on and on. Just think of Moses, Noah, Jonah, Ruth, Mary, etc. And of course, Jesus. It's essential to faith. The question I ask myself is, am I usually more concerned about being served or finding ways to serve others? Serving could be giving someone a cup of coffee after church, which is very good, but there's so much more we can do. So today I'm thinking about four aspects of serving. One, that we should love one another. Two, we should serve one another gladly. And three, we should have a humble attitude. And four, why we serve, the reason why we serve. So the first of these, love one another, was covered by Janet a few weeks ago. But I think it's worth mentioning again in the light of serving one another. Both Paul and Peter in the two passages Ken has just read, refer to love. Paul in verse two advises the Philippians to have the same love for each other as they have for Christ. And Peter in verse eight advises his readers to love one another deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. If you love one another, you can serve one another without dwelling on their bad points Christian love is not put off by the faults of fellow believers. We've all got faults, I have. <laughs> but God covered our sins with love. So this is the proof of being saved, that we have love for each other and that we want to serve each other. Peter wants the Philippian church to make its priority loving one another. All service comes from this, using our God-given gifts and faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So if I'm only concerned with my own needs, then am I really a Christian? Is Christ really in my life? 1 John 3, 16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So if we're called to love one another and to serve one another, how do we do it with joy? We deserved judgment. We received salvation. Our sins are forgiven. We have peace with God. We should have joy and deep gratitude for what God's done for us. So we should serve others and therefore God gladly. Mother Teresa said, holy living consists of doing God's work with a smile. So serving each other shouldn't be a duty or obligation. 1 Peter 4 tells us to serve without grumbling. God wants to work through you. And there is no small service to God. It all matters. The small or hidden ministries in the church often make the biggest difference. It all matters because we're all part of the body of Christ. The passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 underlines this, comparing the body of Christ to the physical body. John 12, 26 says, my father will honor the one who serves me. Serve others, serve God, it's simple. Being ready to serve means expecting the unexpected. That sounded like the Spanish Inquisition from Monty Python when I said that. At any time. God may interrupt your plans. For example, we've just been on holiday and we came back a day early to do the family cafe. Surrender your agenda to God. Remind yourself that you are God's servant, so your agenda will be whatever God wants to bring into your life. Interruptions can be opportunities for service. The church family, that's us, should be at the top of your list, not the bottom of things to do. 
Sometimes we can be fearful of serving others, thinking we're not good enough, so we don't bother. God's not looking for perfection, just to be good enough. God cares about our hearts and motives, not just our actions. He's more interested in why we serve others than how well we do it. So how do we serve gladly? Peter wants his readers to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. In those days, hospitality was important as there weren't many inns and they were too expensive for many people. Encouragement and aid to other Christians was important and it still is today. Human hospitality is a reflection of God's hospitality to us. This is one example of serving, to open our homes to fellow Christians to glorify God. It's not always possible, but it is one example of serving. And then it becomes hospitality against entertaining, the Martha and Mary syndrome. Things don't have to be perfect. I feel blessed that Rob and I have a beautiful home where we can welcome people in. This is a bit of a prompt for me, issue more invitations to people. So if you've not been to our home, I might need to remedy that. There are other ways, obviously, to serve gladly. We should consider God's grace and mercy regularly so that we genuinely want to serve from gratitude. It just overflows. Do it. Don't just study or read about it. And pray for opportunities to serve what the Lord wants you to do. Remember, for example, remember the Lord's Supper. Remember what God's done for you. And then it gives you more enthusiasm for service. And don't worry if the service seems too small. It's not. It's all valuable to God. Marcy has just read the news, the notices. The pay attention to that. Where is service needed? Albert Schweitzer said, the only really happy people are those who have learned how to serve. So it's good for us to serve others. The third aspect of serving, and perhaps the most important, I think, is having the attitude of humility. Humility basically means not considering yourself as more important than others. In the Philippians chapter, verse 3, Paul said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Humility is a daily struggle. Do I meet my needs first or the needs of others? It's easy to focus on what we want. Verse 4, Paul said, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. He doesn't say completely ignore our needs, we're important, but should also take into account other people's needs. We need prayer though, we can't do this on our own. I know I can't. <laughs> Human beings are basically selfish by nature. Young children have to be taught how to share, it doesn't come naturally. We've probably all been with children who've snatched a toy off another child and then it ends in tears. How do we respond when someone takes us for granted or treats us like a servant, bosses us around? The message version of Matthew 5 verse 41 says, if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. Humility was the attitude of Jesus. God wants us to walk humbly with him. Humility is one of the most important things God seeks from us. It's countercultural. Do what's best for you. Look out for number one. Doesn't matter, it's not hurting anybody. But God's people should live by different standards, guided by God who humbled himself. The reading from Philippians today 
verses 6 to 11 was a hymn and it was evidently known to Paul's readers. We don't really know if it was written by Paul or by somebody else. But it starts, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus Christ had the nature of God from the beginning. He chose to make himself nothing by becoming a servant in human form taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Christ humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, for our salvation. He willingly became a servant. The book of Isaiah 52 and 53 is commonly called the suffering servant because it refers to Jesus as crucifixion. But it was written many, many years before Christ was born. The scene was set for servanthood. Humility is a necessary requirement of serving others and raising up Jesus. It also means allowing our, ourselves to be served by others, not thinking we can cope on our own so the fourth aspect of serving is the reason. Why should we serve one another? Well, obviously we should serve each other because we love each other. But another reason to consider, as Peter reminds his readers in verse seven, the end of all things is near. It's said that those who are most heavenly minded are of most earthly use. Keep your eye on heaven. Peter was saying, live now as God wants us to, serve each other with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. It's the reason Jesus served, so that God may be praised. Philippians verse 10 to 11, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This gives Jesus the highest honour and authority. Some of us might recognise those words from a hymn, at the name of Jesus, which is what it was taken from. This is the reason we should use our gifts, to serve others, so that God may be praised. Both Paul and Peter stress the importance of unity, be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. God has given us gifts for this purpose, to build up the church and therefore ensure that God will be praised. Peter says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. We all have a gift of some sort and they're all important. So just think, what am I good at that I can offer as a service to other people? Maybe what do I know that I can teach others? What can I make or give someone as a blessing? God wants us to love and serve others unselfishly. He's promised a reward in Hebrews 6 verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you helped his people and continue to help them. So to sum up, serve out of love, gladly, without grumbling, with an attitude of humility, so that in all things, God may be praised. I have retired from paid employment, but one role we can never retire from is that of being a servant to God and therefore a servant to one another. So I'll just finish with a prayer. 
Thank you, Lord, that you have led each one of us at different times in our lives, at different places on our first faith journey to this church. Thank you that we are here to serve one another with the strength you provide. Thank you that by serving one another in love, we are able to be united and can build up your church so that in all things you may be praised. And now in the words of a hymn, brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Amen. <laughs> 